Well, good morning. You survived 2020. You ought to be uh, commended for making it through one of the craziest years I think any of us have ever, ever experienced. Here's to a good start to a good new year, right? It's got to be better. It's got to be. Pray that it is. Just a couple of brief announcements. We're going to start a couple new uh, life groups on Wednesday night. Uh, one is called Escape the Ordinary. And this is through our uh, Right Now Media um, subscription. So you're welcome to view it at home if you want. It's called Escape the Ordinary. And the neat thing about this little study is um, you're actually going to learn how you can recognize the promptings of God and experience more of God working in and through you as you step out in obedience to Him. And as the title would indicate, you can escape the ordinary, that God wants to work in you and he wants to work through you regardless of your status or whatever so that's on wednesday nights and i'll be starting this wednesday both at five fifteen and seven o'clock encourage you to uh take part in that and again if you don't want to come on wednesday night hook it up on right now media i think most of you have that subscription if you don't talk to me or uh, pastor harry or braille and we'll get you a subscription to that it's free to you it, we pay a monthly fee for the church there's no uh not out of your pocket that way, so that's one of them. The second one is we're going to fire up the Pure Desire uh, ministry again, and this is for men that need to break free from a variety of, uh, of addictions as well as hurts from the past. Um, we've had this group going probably three years now, four. It's amazing. The results that we're seeing when men submit themselves to God, when men are accountable to one another, and when they face um, the hurts and admit the addictions that they have, it is, I just can't say enough about this group, Pure Desire, and that's on Thursday nights, uh, and we meet at 6.30 here at the church. Gentlemen, I would highly encourage you to take part in that with or without an addiction. It's just it's phenomenal stuff, so... Uh, that's that. Um, uh, I guess see where I'm going here. We're going to ask uh, the Bells to come up. They want to dedicate a little page. Oh, my goodness, look at that dress. <laughs> I don't want to break her. I don't to... <laughs> that's great. Good morning. Oh, no kidding. Wow. This is great. So in the book of Deuteronomy, we read this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So, believing that page is a gift from God and that God will hold you accountable for her, do you now solemnly confess that it is your purpose to dedicate her to the Lord and to his service? Will you faithfully discharge your God-given responsibilities as parents, as outlined in God's word? Will you pray with her, instruct her faithfully in the teaching of God's holy word? Will you teach her to read the word of God and to pray and to lead a holy life? Will you take her faithfully to a place of worship and do all that lies within you to bring her to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? If you, if you will, will you answer, I will? And to the congregation, I want to know that you have a responsibility to this family. 
I'm going to ask that you would pray for the bells, that you would encourage them to grow together, that you would do all that is in your power to assist Paige in coming to know Jesus Christ as her personal Savior and Lord. And if you're willing to do that, I'm going to ask that you would stand as a sign of your commitment to help raise Paige in a way that would be honoring to the Lord. And now let us dedicate Paige. I'll try. <laughs> All right, let us pray. Father God, we know that life is a gift from you. You are the author of life. And this is a blessed time to be able to dedicate Paige to you. Lord, we pray for Devin and Caitlin, that you give them the grace and the mercy that they need raising this child in a way that would be pleasing to you. And Lord, we pray for Paige at a young age, that she would come to faith in you. I pray that you would even now fill her with your Holy Spirit. Guide her, we pray. And through her life, I pray as she knows you, that she will be used as an instrument to lead others to a saving knowledge in you as well. So it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we dedicate Paige to you this day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Not so bad. There you go. Congratulations. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, what a blessing. Each week we try and bless a different uh, segment of our community or society, and uh, this morning we want to be mindful to pray. For those of our government leaders, I don't have to tell you this as well, that there's a lot of stuff going on that God needs to intervene. We need to see a, uh, an awakening among our government leaders. We have been tasked as believers in Christ to pray for them, to pray for all those who are in authority. And this morning, as part of our prayer, we are going to pray for them we as a church are asking you then throughout the week to pray for all those in authority, that they would lead godly lives, that they would, if they're not believers, that they would become uh, believers in Christ and that they would make decisions that are in agreement with God's word. So uh, pray for that. We also want to thank all those who have given uh, to support the ministries here over the past year. It's been one of our most uh, challenging years uh, financially. But uh, thank you for giving. We had to make uh, some major cuts along the way. But by God's grace and your faithfulness, we're uh, above water. So we are thankful for that and just would uh, continue to thank you for your uh, continued giving. Um, so with that, let us pray again. Yeah, Father God, thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you that we're alive. Thank you that we get to come to a place of worship with absolute freedom, no fear of being arrested or somebody trailing us and seeing where we're going and what we're doing or harassing us. So we thank you for that. Lord, this morning we want to pray and lift up all of our government leaders from local uh, city council, mayor, our governor, our senators, representatives, all the way up to the president. Lord God, would you please, please, intervene and help the men and women that are in leadership to wake up, like be awake spiritually, that those that are not yet saved would be born again even this day that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And for those that are saved, God, that they will stand up, they will stand strong, they will speak up for you, that they will help enact laws that are in agreement with your word. And as a nation, God, we can get back on track. You're telling us, you're asking us, you're commanding us to pray for those in authority. And we're doing that today, and I pray that you'd remind us to pray for those in authority throughout this coming week. Lord, we want to commit and dedicate this service to you. We know that apart from you, we can do absolutely nothing. We want your name to be glorified. We want your name to be honored. Lord, we want to see your kingdom come. We want to see your will being done in us and through us. 
And Father God, to that end, we pray now for your Holy Spirit to come and minister to us and minister through us. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please stand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please stand and join us in worship today.
these lungs to sing once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear. last song is a new song to you guys. Um, I just, we, this service is kind of on the holiness of God, and this song just struck me. Um, just, it's called Love So Holy, and just about the powerful, powerful God we have, um, and just the love he has for us that um, just outshines everything. <laughs> and that's just been really speaking to me today, this week, and I just yeah, I challenge you to listen to these words and um, just worship God through this.
of prayer. Our theme is holiness this week. You're probably aware that we are looking at our statement of faith, and every time I pick that up, I have a sense of this holy task that I've been assigned for us to take a new look at that statement. Recently, I walked into our bedroom at home to grab something in the morning, and there my wife with a tear streaming down her face, eyes closed, hands lifted to heaven with the worship music playing, and I realized I had just walked into a holy moment, and I backed away quietly. In the book of Exodus, on the side of the mountain, Moses is given instruction to take four equal parts of fragrant spices and have a perfumer mix them together because there was to be this holy fragrance that was to be used at the tent of meeting alone. We have the concept of holiness because we have a holy God, pure, undefiled, and undefilable. Our God, who is utterly pure and completely separate from all that is broken and sinful. This theme of holiness, the whole concept of our God being a holy God, should draw us into worship away from the noise of the world, away from the clutter of our minds, away from all that distracts and, and calling us into that mysterious, the beautiful, the sacred. A holy God calls us to himself. Let's enter in. Well, good morning again. Um... Today, we are beginning a uh, 40 days of prayer together. We're wanting and encouraging everybody in our congregation or for visitors, you're welcome to join us. You can, uh, we're joining this with the Greater Alliance family around the country. And I just want you to know if you look in your uh, bulletin, there's a, a web address that you can go to. There are daily devotionals and they are geared for youth, for children, and for adults. And if you go to that website, Click on the link there, uh, 40 Days of Prayer, you'll get a daily devotional that you can follow along with as we go through these 40 Days of Prayer. So during the next 40 days, we're going to be focusing on uh, the attributes of God. We're going to be focusing on repentance, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, sharing the gospel both locally and globally. We're going to see or focus on marginalized people, how we can Number one, have our eyes open to those who are less fortunate around us, but also how to minister to them. And lastly, we're going to take a look and be praying on Alliance uh, missions around the world. So again, I'm inviting you, your family, to participate in these 40 days of prayer, along with many others in our Alliance family. And I cannot think of a better way, honestly, to start the new year than to be focused on prayer. So please make yourself available to that. Um, so this week, the focus of our devotions, focus of our prayers, is going to be on the attributes of God. Some of you may be asking yourself, what's an attribute? What is an attribute of God? So that's like the, uh, I guess, the big word. Okay, If I would tell you we're going to talk about the distinguishing qualities or the distinguishing characteristics of God, that's what an attribute is. Okay, It's what sets God apart from anybody and anything on this planet, in this universe. And some of the distinguishing characteristics, uh, character traits, qualities of God are the following. And this is only a sampling of that. God is eternal, right? He always was, and he always will be. There's no other being in the universe that is eternal except for God. God is love. We need to understand that what he does, he loves, comes out of who he is, and he is love. He is the definition of love. God is sovereign. That word means, any guesses? Hard to believe it after his last year. God is always in control all the time. Whether we understand it, whether we appreciate it or not, God is sovereign. He has all things under his control at all times. Okay? 
God is all present. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. Again, no other being in this universe is all powerful, all knowing, all present. God is. That's a distinguishing quality, a distinguishing characteristic of God. God is immutable. Immutable means. Immutable means he doesn't change. God never changes. Thank the Lord for that, that he doesn't change. God is merciful. God is gracious. I could be up here all morning telling you all the characteristics, the attributes of God. I want to make note, or you to make note, I put an insert in the bulletin, which is the handful more of the attributes of God. And again, our focus this week is not only to know about the attributes of God, but then to take time to pray, to worship, to give God the glory that he deserves for the being that he is and the fact that he allows us to be in relationship with him is nothing short of a miracle. What we're going to focus on this morning then for a few minutes is the holiness of God. The holiness of God. To understand what it means to be holy as we're talking about God is that it means that God is without fault. He is without any blemish. There's no defect at all. He is separate from. Okay? God is unique. God is holy. God is separate from sin. God has no shortcomings, no blemishes, no um, fault within him. And we need to understand the importance of this attribute of God, the holiness of God. It's a foundation for who God is, as well as how he conducts himself and how we can relate to him. I want you to think about this. If God is not holy if he is not perfect, if he is not without fault, if there's any chance that maybe one of God's characteristics, any, even the tiniest little bit, maybe he's not 100% fill in the blank, then the rest of God's attributes would be called into question. Understanding the holiness of God is vital for you, for your relationship with him, for how we conduct ourselves, for how we approach God and how we relate in to him and worship him. There's many ways we can and should respond to the holiness of God. What I want to present to you this morning is there are two ways that we ought to respond to the holiness of God. One is worship. Do you understand that God is inviting us into a relationship with him? The God who is perfect, the God who is all-knowing, the God who is all-powerful, the God who is never-changing, the God who is eternal, the God who is gracious and merciful. All this, God is inviting us into a relationship with him. That invites, that encourages us to worship him, to give God the glory, the praise that is worthy of his name. And secondly, knowing the holiness of God, it ought to prompt us to be willing to serve, knowing that God is inviting us into this relationship. And once we come into his presence and understand who he is and understand the holiness of God, how can we do anything but in obedience to him and out of adoration, out of worship for him, seek ways to serve him as he would call us? I want you, if you have your Bibles with you, to turn to uh, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, okay, Isaiah is in the Old Testament, just in case you're wondering, it's not where we go very often, I'll be honest with you, Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to get a little glimpse of what this holiness of God looks like, what the response is, and then how can we uh, apply this to our lives and how throughout this coming week at least, can we worship and serve God in a way that respects and honors his holiness. So Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, and this, the I here is referring to Isaiah, who at this point is not yet a prophet, but he's going to be. Okay, Isaiah, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. I'll just tell you, that's a little like out there for me. I don't understand this creature, but I'm taking it. God's word is telling us this is what happened. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I'm going to take a little aside here before I keep reading. Do you know that this is the only characteristic of God that is repeated three times? We see it again in the book of Revelation, when the angels are bowing before him and worshiping him, worshiping God. They say, holy, holy, holy. Nowhere else in Scripture do we see merciful, 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 gracious, 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 right? He is all that, but I'm saying there is significance to this repeated again and again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's drawing significance, importance, drawing our attention to. This is very important. Don't forget this. Remember, God is holy. God's holy. If you don't remember yet, God is holy. He's holy. Lord God Almighty. Isaiah's response, and as we continue, he says, Woe to me. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. You understand what's taking place here? A man, a human, is literally in the presence of God at his throne right before him. And when it's not revealed, when it's made known to him that God is holy, these seraphs, whatever they are, worshiping him, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty. What is Isaiah's response? Like, I don't belong here. I'm unfit to be in the presence of a holy God. Why? Because I'm not separate from sin. I am with fault. I have my shortcomings. And now I am in the presence of one who is pure. No fault, no blemish. And Isaiah's response is, whoa. I don't belong here. And then look what happens next. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with the live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for. That God would be kind enough to take away our sin, our guilt. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. Coming into his presence, the holy presence of God, the pure presence of God, the powerful presence of God. And he extends grace, mercy. I cleanse you. Your sins are atoned for. Isaiah's response. I'm sorry, then the Lord, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for me? And Isaiah said, here am I. Here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. And then there's a whole long litany of stuff that Isaiah is commanded to tell a very stubborn and a very rebellious people. I want to take just a couple minutes to show you a brief video that explains holiness in the Bible in a way that I don't think I could do, do it justice. Again, this is through uh, Right Now Media, or you can go on YouTube and you cl uh, click on the, the Bible Project, and this is Holiness in the Bible. Just please take a listen to this, watch this, and then I'll have a few concluding remarks. You've probably heard the word before, or at least sang it in a church song once or twice. And for most people, this idea is really just connected to being a morally good person. So 
God is holy because he's morally perfect. Yeah, that is part of it. But in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even bigger and more rich. What it's really describing is how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one and only being with the power to make a world full of such beauty and life. And so all these abilities, they make God utterly unique, which is the meaning of the word holy. So a helpful way to think about God's holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. The sun is unique, at least within our solar system, and it's really powerful. It's the source of all this beautiful life on our planet. And so you could say that the sun is holy. And you can actually take this metaphor even further in that the whole area around the sun is also holy. Yeah, because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. Yeah, exactly. So that very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. I mean, the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. And in the same way, there's this paradox at the heart of God's own holiness. Because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness, it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush. So God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. And Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, hey, don't come any closer. It's intense. It's actually that intensity of God's holiness that's explored even more in the stories about Israel's temple, which was the main place where God's holy presence was located. And at the center of the temple was this room called the Most Holy Place, this the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you're an Israelite living in the land around the temple or a priest working right in the temple, you're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. Yeah, this is a problem. So how's it supposed to work? Well, in the Bible, the solution is that you need to become pure. So like being morally pure. Yeah, and that's easy enough to understand. But the Bible spends a lot of time talking about another kind of purity, being ritually pure, which is a state where you separate yourself from anything related to death like touching things like diseased skin or dead bodies or even certain bodily fluids. All these make you impure. And becoming ritually impure isn't necessarily sinful. What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in an impure state. And so that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure, steps to become pure, so that they could go into the temple again. So that's what the book of Leviticus is about. Right. But it doesn't stop there. This idea keeps developing. So later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story by a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision where he's in the temple and he's right in God's presence. He's totally terrified. Yeah, he knows the rules. He shouldn't even be in there. And he's worried about being destroyed. And then this crazy creature called a seraphim. Yeah, that is a crazy creature. <laughs> totally. So it flies over with a hot coal, and then it sears Isaiah's lips with the coal and says something really weird. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. Yeah, it's remarkable because normally if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. But now here's this new idea where you have this coal, this very holy and pure object, and it touches Isaiah and it transfers its purity to him. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. I mean, the implications of this are just huge. But there's one more development this time from another prophet, Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple and he sees water trickling out from it. And then that water turns into a stream and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. And he claims that he's fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a, a woman with chronic bleeding or dead people. And when he touches them, their impurity should transfer over to Jesus. But instead, Jesus' purity transfers to them and actually heals their bodies. Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. 
and Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness and that he and his followers were now God's temple so that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. And so this is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now, but Where's this all heading? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. This time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there, flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. We believe the Bible is one complete narrative, so we're making these videos to trace a theme that goes from the beginning to the end of Scripture. We're also making videos for every book. Pretty interesting, is it not? That God is inviting us into his presence. We are unholy. He is holy. He takes his holiness and transfers it to us who are unholy. And now, what does he want us to do? He wants us to be those messengers, those men and women and children who are taking the message, if you will, of the holiness of God and spreading it. This is one of those gifts that's not meant to be kept to ourselves. Again, Isaiah comes into the presence of the Lord. He understands, he recognizes his guilt. The Lord takes that coal, the seraph takes that coal, touches lips, he's cleansed. And then Isaiah's response is, Hear my Lord, send me. I'll go. I'll be that person to go and share the gospel, share the good news. So again, our holiness, I'm sorry, our response to the holiness of God ought to be twofold. One, we should be worshiping. And secondly, we should have a willingness to serve him, whatever he asks. So this week, I want to give you uh, a challenge. I want to encourage you, number one, to take time to worship him, right? Right? Now, please understand, worship is not just something that happens on Sunday morning when we sing songs. Are you with me? That's good, and I'm all for that. Do it. Sing as much as you want. Sing in the shower. Sing in the car. Sing wherever. That's one way to worship God. And by the way, that handout that's in the bulletin is another way to worship God. Look through these attributes, these character qualities of God, and worship Him. Thank Him for being the Lord who heals. Thank him for being your redeemer. Thank him. Worship him as the bread of life. I mean, just go through and recognize his attributes. That's one way to worship him. That worship of God, then, ought to lead us to serve. And in the book of Romans, most of the times we go to Romans chapter 12, and we look at verses 1 and 2, and we bypass Romans 11, 33 to 35. And here's what we read. And again, here's the response out of this worship of God ought to be a willingness to serve. Romans 12, beginning in verse 30, uh, 11, beginning in verse 33, says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That's worship. That's acknowledging God, who he is, what he does. Therefore, Paul writes, I urge you, because we are in the presence and we can worship such an awesome God, therefore I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God is holy. God is without fault. God is without any blemish or any defect at all. Our response to the holiness of God ought to be one of worship and a willingness to serve him in whatever way that he asks of us. 
And I would be remiss if I did not ask this morning, if you're here or listening online, and you're not yet in a relationship with this holy God, I'm telling you, right now is the time to enter into that relationship and begin a life-transforming relationship where you are connected to him. He is connected to you. He is giving you, imparting to you his life, his holiness, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. So I want to ask, as we close here, if you'll bow your heads. And if you'd like to connect with God in a life-transforming relationship right now, I'm just simply going to ask that you would repeat this prayer. And you're not praying it to me or anybody else. You're praying this to the Lord, to God, the Holy God. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. And I realize that my good deeds could never make up for my wrongs. Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I believe you were born to save me from my sins. I repent. I turn away from my sins and I turn to you. Please, Lord, forgive me. I surrender everything I am and everything I have to you. I trust you now to be my Savior. And with your help, I will follow you as my Lord in the fellowship of your church. So, Father God, for anybody who's prayed that prayer just now, I pray, God, you are, you will be real to them. I pray that they'll be connected to you in a life-transforming relationship. I pray that they'll be connected to the body of Christ, wherever that may be. And I pray, God, for those that have just made this commitment, Lord, that they would let somebody else know so the body can help them grow in their relationship with you. And Lord, I would pray for all of us, whatever our status is in relationship to you, Lord God, that we would take time to worship you. You are a holy God. You are a pure God. You are a righteous God. You are a just God, a merciful God. There's no fault or blemish within you. God, let us come into your presence. And as we come into your presence, I pray, God, that you will transform us and you'll continue that transformation. And we will take this knowledge that we have of you, this gift that you've given to us, and we will do our part to give it to others. We will do our part to share the gospel, the good news, in whatever form that takes place. Lord, out of our worship of you, I pray every man, woman, and child that is listening right now will also be spurred on to a willingness to serve. Lord, we worship and serve you. And that's not just restricted to Sunday morning. Help us to live out our faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, make yourself available to the 40-day uh, prayer devotionals. Again, they have them for children. They have them for youth. They have them for adults. Uh, I just lost it. There's a thing in your bulletin with a web address that you can download that. And if you have trouble with that, I'm going to refer you to Harry because I'm not really like the computer guy. So if you need help, we're, we want to help you with that. I would ask you to stand and receive the benediction. And just to let you know that we do have different life groups available that we'll be meeting in a few minutes. So may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ. So that with one heart and one, with one mouth, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you.